as well. All right, without further ado, uh, Brad. Can you hear me? We can All hear right. you, but you have introduced yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Brad Nelson, uh, doer of various forthy things. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, two things. Uh, one is a, a deferred talk from a bit back, uh, just focused on uh, fourth haiku and, and doing some uh, winter themes. The uh, the second is uh, as I as I prepared to, to give the first talk, I, I realized that uh, there was a an, an interesting uh, notice uh, about the fourth haiku, the place that I host fourth haikus, and so that will inform the first part of the talk. Uh, so, um, for those of you who have not heard or seen of it, fourth haiku uh, was something that I first came up with in 2011. It's the idea of taking some small programs written in fourth and using them to generate colorful pictures, animations, and, and later sound. Um, really what it is is a, a pixel uh, or fragment shader represented in a, in a chunk of fourth. Um, the, uh, the plumbing that, uh, that uh, makes it run on the web is uh, a, a converter written in JavaScript that converts from fourth to JavaScript and then weirdly from, from that to a WebGL shader, which is a little, a little bit like a C program. Um, any, uh, it's done this way so that it can take advantage of running on the GPU. Um, the, one of the, the things that has gotten some interest from it over the years is that uh, anyone can post to the site and, and anyone can create a drive work. So you, could, you can either, you know, you can, you can sort of put something out there for others to see and, uh, and, and even if you don't feel inspired yourself, you can, you can modify something that someone else has created and create something further. Um, it runs on the web and uh, it is backed by a server that uh, runs on, on Google App Engine. Uh, I'll, I'll just briefly show it for the moment and we'll, we'll actually be diving into it a little bit more. So basically, uh, there's a collection of, of these haikus and uh, they, are, um, they, are, they can be animated, they can have sound and so on. Um, uh, and then uh, when, you, when you, you're in this view and you float over a single one, it will animate only when you do that largely for performance reasons. Um, and uh, the key thing about these programs is that uh, they are uh, remarkably small. So let's, I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, a Space Invaders one. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, not, not dissimilar to, um, let me find a good example of a very small one, actually. A proper, a proper haiku uh, would be, for example, one that is actually uh, fits the constraints of uh, a fourth, and so it's the constraints of a, of a five seven five uh, line thing. Um, not dissimilarly to uh, to uh, what Mark was uh, had, had done uh, for his documentation website, there is a little bit of documentation, uh, and if you click on an individual word, you actually get a description of its. Uh, of its uh, behavior for the built-in words. Uh, and uh, so anyways, um, the, um, uh, the, key, the key problem, of course, uh, uh, is, is that I run this on App Engine. Uh, App Engine is a, uh, a, a pretty cool tool over the years. So it was launched uh, in 2008, uh, actually around about the time uh, where, where I started, uh, actually shortly after I started working at Google. And uh, initially, it um, supported Python, Python 2, and then later uh, support was added for a variety of other uh, languages. And it's it's sort of it was it was cloud computing sort of before it was cool. It was designed to run at scale from from uh, uh, you know tiny a tiny uh, amount of traffic to uh, to you know millions or maybe billions of users. Um, and uh, the key the key thing that uh, made me uh, fourth haiku on it was that it was it was free for tiny and so I you know more or less paid nothing to, to put something up and host it and have it run somewhere and store some data and uh, the the model back then that sadly I you know did not I, I think did not catch on in the way that it uh, maybe ought to have or could have uh, was that it had a lot, a lot of things built in and so 
the the uh, you know the challenges that you had to use a particular built-in data store and account handling and memory cache and and uh, particular style of web templates and um, but if you used these uh, they sort of forced you into patterns that notionally would work well if you uh, you know to start but would uh, would also scale up and uh, in some cases that made it made made it a little bit challenging to use there were some uh, properties of, of particularly how the data store works that um, that are maybe not things you would do if you were sort of trying to do the simplest thing uh, but but have the property that they happen to scale um, for many years it was it was very compat compatible they, there was a focus on kind of incremental change um, there were a few uh, kind of major moments uh, uh, one early one um, that's, that's sort of invisible to users of the website but that uh, was was a little bit of a, a hassle for me to figure out back in the day was that uh, there was a um, originally the data store system for it was uh, would scale but had some limitations in terms of uh, surviving multiple, uh, surviving uh, a data center going down, and so it was. Re it would replicate already in the original version between multiple data centers, but it, uh, uh, in certain cases, uh, you could end up with database inconsistencies if if the wrong data center went right down at the wrong time, and so uh, because there was a a, a user observer or a, a you know program observable change. Um, they uh, they did the odd thing of saying, well, we're going to, you know, for every program that's on the old system, we're going to give you an instance on the new system. And then, uh, you know, when you're ready, you can kind of do an alias and transition over. And so to this day, the the internal labeling for it on App Engine for, for my instance is fourth slot dash HRD, but there's an alias from the original. Um, there were small changes to the Python database library over the years. And then sort of, uh, um, you know, the, I think what, something that happened fairly early in the process uh, was that there was a slow push to deprecate some of the, the user account handling. It was based on uh, approaches to things like uh, um, federated login that uh, also sort of maybe didn't get the reach that they might have, uh, you know, where the, the assumption I think back in, in those days was that, that uh, you might log into everything with a, a Google account or a Facebook account or, you know, one of a handful of major providers. And that it's still out there, it's still used for things, but it's, uh, it has actually some interesting and positive security properties, but uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, sort of didn't always make sense to users, didn't make sense to, to, to businesses and so on. But for many years, uh, it was very stable. And I, I, I used to think of it almost as sort of the perfect place to put a, a so-called dead hand. You know, if I wanted to leave some program running and make sure that it uh, did, did something, even if I wasn't around to, to do something with it for, you know, you know, spans of five, six, seven years, you would, you know, leave something up and it could run and have users interact with it and, and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't need to be tampered with. But uh, nothing ever lasts, unfortunately. And, and this January, they they finally announced that the old uh, uh, the old sort of core original runtime and support for Python two uh, was going away. And I think they used the transition from Python two to to three to be kind of a moment to drop a bunch of old things. Uh, There's probably interesting lessons in in how um, the Python community made this sort of breaking change from Python two to three, but uh, in any event, I, I, I noticed early this year uh, something that I think I had seen kind of fly by and thought, oh, you know, that's far in the future. Uh, but they they uh, sent out sort of a last warning that, well, you know, on January 30th, uh, that would be the last day that you'd be able to push out uh, things on the old version. Um, they do, as far as I can tell, continue to support uh, if you haven't uh, pushed anything, if, you're, if the site is completely static. Uh, you can leave leave some of the old run times, but I'm not sure how much longer that will work. And so, for a few of the other things I've got on App Engine, I'm kind of looking into making the transition. And uh, I, I think part of what's going on is that um, as cloud computing has become more of a thing, one of the one of the early sort of things they got wrong and then maybe right or whatnot with App Engine was that uh, it, it was very much you know batteries included. Here's the Here's a particular model for how you would build your application, but the assumption was that you would you would write the application uh, with a dependency on on App Engine. It would be written for App Engine. Whereas in the intervening years, the you know what happened is that uh, people instead want to purchase uh, virtual machines that are just a, a generic Linux system and can do arbitrary stuff. 
a little bit more of the batteries included stuff has come back over time, but not quite in the same way. And so um, they've ultimately sort of underneath transitioned, I think, App Engine to, to other, uh, to, to run more or less on VMs that are sort of spun up behind your back. Um, and so there's a bunch of changing requirements. Um, they, uh, they finally required uh, use of a package manager to pull in your dependencies. And really you're almost pushing more of a, a snapshot of what you want to have run on, on, on a, a VM. Um, they, they have a new interface to the data store and they got, got rid of the, uh, they had a search API that made it convenient for me to add a, a search feature to, 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 to the thing. So um, uh, remarkably the data store more or less stays as it was. It was, I think, influenced very heavily by Bigtable, what very likely implemented on it. Um, uh, Bigtable, for, for those unfamiliar, is, a, is a sort of the, the great, great granddaddy of, uh, of uh, like at least modern NoSQL databases, where the idea is that you, you support uh, kind of a dumb key value data store, but, uh, and, and have eventual consistency rather than uh, things like ACID semantics and, 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 and uh, traditional SQL databases. Uh, it's a it's a big uh, you know sort of flat index on on row column and then and a timestamp, and then you build your own structure on top of it. So this is a good design if you want to scale, um, but it it's sort of not invisible to the user. If you're if you you want to treat it like a like a conventional database, you have to sort of you know kind of adjust your thinking, um, and you can only do it transactions at least you know in, in big table at the at row level. And uh, but it has the the you know, advantage that it can scale to, you know, kind of worldwide scale. Um, so cloud data store, which is the, I, I guess the rebranding of what was, was App Engine data store originally, uh, ki kind of tries to do a, a thinly veiled attempt to make this model look more like SQL. It has a notion of entities that are a little bit like rows in a table of, of a SQL database. Um, but then there's some some specialness about when you add uh, when you add a row, every row has to have a key, and then there can be relationships uh, uh, in a, in a uh, hierarchy. Really, what that's doing is exposing that big table uh, uh, row ID, and uh, then it also does some some automatic things that sort of big table doesn't do out of the box. Like uh, it it keeps indexes for all of the fields, so you can at least do basic queries because with big table you can really only query on the um on the on the uh the row key otherwise um and then you ha you have the ability to add additional indexes that it will sort of automate the process of building up uh it still uses eventual consistency uh but it does have a little bit uh, uh better support it's, there's some support for transactions that are a little bit more elaborate than than what you get sort of raw with raw big table and, and, and this model has, you know, sort of stuck around, although they've kind of changed the wrappings around it over time. Um, this is the, this is the, 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 the entity element that I uh, way back originally used for, for fourth haiku. So it's, you know, I'm just keeping track of for each haiku, uh, when it was created, the title of it, the author, the block of code uh, for it. Um, I, I keep a, uh, a score and a rank. I'm forgetting that right at this moment what, what the difference between the two is. Um, and then uh, a last modified stamp. And uh, it's many, many years ago, I did a, a project to kind of retroactively recover uh, uh, a, a guess at the genetic lineage of the, of the derived works. Uh, because I didn't, when I first added the ability to create a derived work, have the have the good sense to record when a new haiku is created, what uh, uh, which haiku it was based on. So I did a, a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a differencing algorithm based reconstruction of of what the likely parentage was, and then I I started recording it going forward. Um, so what all did I have to change? I had to switch the search API to, to just do uh, like a prefix search on the, the author and title prefixes. This means that if you do a search right now, unfortunately it doesn't, it isn't as nice as it was before. Before you could kind of search for a bunch of arbitrary text in the haiku. Now you, you really are only searching on a prefix of the, the title or the, uh, the author name. Uh, I may circle back. There are some alternatives to move to, but there isn't a, a, a sort of a direct drop-in solution. Um, I, uh, I had to add in the, the, uh, the Python library dependencies explicitly. Um, 
they changed, I, th I think there was one prior C change where they forced you to sort of change the the, the web uh, templating framework and, and now they're using a thing called Flask and it's, you know, different but not that different and so sort of rewriting a bunch of the storage pieces of it but um, nothing, nothing sort of fundamentally you know, different about it, just a different choice of representation. A little, little bit of clever use of, there's a, there's a uh, Python feature called decorators that, uh, that a few languages, Java has this as well, where you have a, um, the ability to do a little bit of stuff that can uh, hook into compile time operation, and maybe in some future talk I should make some comparison. It's, it's a sort of a, a very limited version of some things you can do very easily in Forest. But. Um, and then, of course, I had to switch to the, the new API. So, um, anyways, it, it, all, all that is to say uh, that, that sucked a bit of time. It's, it's a shame when things don't stay the same, but it's it's nice that it was able to to, to be kept in, in its current form. So now I'm going to switch to something completely different and uh, go through the process of creating uh, a few winter haikus. Um, let me, in the interest of things being a little bit more visible, change which part of the screen I'm sharing, so that will zoom in. And let's go over to uh, to the haiku editor. So um, I'm going to sort of go through these real time, um, a little bit like a cooking show uh, with some pre-made pieces. But um, so basically, uh, I'm going to make a, a few of them and, and stop me if you have questions. Um, so um, first of all, uh, I, I think we'll start with a for you know winter theme. We're going to start with a snowman, and uh, the snowman you know is largely going to be built out of circles. And so I'm going to I'm going to create a word that uh, takes into account uh, your position on the screen. And actually, just actually before I do that, let me just give the sort of really brief review. Recall that the fourth IQ is basically um, the outside of the program is being rerun per pixel on the screen. And so if you have the x coordinate be the, uh, uh, or sorry, and, and the value that you leave on the stack, or rather the three values that you leave on the stack will be the RGB value that you get. So if you leave x on the stack, um, as the x value varies across the haiku, you get a different amplitude. If you put a, put a zero and then an x, you know, then you're going to see green. And if you put another zero and an x, you'll see blue. Um, you can also mix in Y and then uh, blend them together. You could do, you know, X times Y, and then you maybe get some interesting patterns there. Maybe if you do, you know, times times 10 and mod it with one, then you get sort of patterns like that. So you can you can very rapidly build up some, some interesting visuals. So anyways, to build a snowman, I'll want to have some circles. And so um, what I'll do is I will uh, take into take in the center of the circle and the radius, and then I will subtract that from my y value. And I can, let me implement a square operation. So dupe star, and then I'll square that value, and then I will do a swap and subtract it from x and square that value. And then I will add the two. So I've got the sum of the squares. I'll take the square root and then I'll swap to get the R value. And then I'll check, I'll use the less than operation to check to see if, uh, if it's less. So if, if it's less than uh, the radius. So for example, if I put at the center uh, a circle of let's say radius 0.1, then I will get out a red circle. So. So that's great. Um, uh, this is the part where I think I'll do a little bit of cooking show cheating. So um, you can pull out, uh, you know, let's pick some interesting positions to put the, the parts of the snowman. And if I have a second uh, part for, I'm going to do kind of your canonical three, three bitted <laughs> snowman. So if you had the next layer and if you just do it separately, right, you're going to get that in in green, and I'm doing this in red because my, my intention at the end is to sort of make everything all white. So I'm going to add those two together, and now I, I get that lump, and then I can add on um, I can add on the, the top. So that's the, the, the shape of it. I, I want to have a little bit of a, a face on it. So 
what I'll do is I'll I'll subtract out uh, the uh, say the eyes and another eye and uh, and then and then a bunch of littler circles let's say for the mouth and then of course I want to make the thing white so I'll duplicate that value from the red channel into the green and the blue and I've got my my white snowman all right so I've submitted that and there there it is in the in the in the uh, the list of haikus well let's let's do another one there's a little hint of me me playing around uh, ahead of time um, with that one so so one uh, general thing that you'll find with making interesting things with with a, a fairly small program is that uh, sines and cosines are great for that because they oscillate and so I'm going to take do something like uh, if I take you know the, the sine of y and uh, I check to see um, I check to see when when it's less than than a certain value that gives me something like that but if I you know increase the if I multiply y by some other other value, I'll get I'll get a thing like that, and so I can take several uh, sine waves and add them up, and it doesn't really matter. You know, it's sometimes useful to have sort of quad val values that are kind of some semi mutually prime if you're mixing components, but you can imagine you can add up several several sine waves. And uh, you know you can quickly get some interesting patterns um, if you divide them by you know you can you can kind of narrow the range and uh, what what I'm aiming for is to create uh, the effect of a of a frozen lake so uh, I'll, I'll you know pick some some maybe one one more of these and um, and that's not too bad although I'll, I'll go with the one that I I canned before. And uh, so let me kind of narrow that, narrow that out. So we've got kind of the edge of the lake, and then, um, and then let's sort of mix in a different, uh, a different set of the same, the same kind of thing because we want to have a little bit of shading and, and contour. So I'll, uh, I'll do the same thing, but maybe with, tweak the values slightly. And and so if I, if I do that. Uh, now you've got kind of two two layers to work with, and a pattern. You know this this gives a very hard edge between the pieces, and so a thing that I will I will often do when I if I use the less than sign, you know it sort of it, it gives you the sharp edge, but that's not always what you want. So what I can do instead is um, uh, replace that with a uh, uh, I can I can replace that with a um, uh, what you call it with a with a with just a plus sign, or sometimes you, a plus and a subtract is useful. And you'll notice that gives kind of the same shape, but uh, but kind of smoothened out uh, to it. And then um, I want to mix these layers together differently because this is, this is sort of not the right color scheme. And um, and so one of the things that I uh, would like to do here is is maybe let's let's tweak this first. You, you'll see I've got essentially two of these on the stack: this first set and then the second set. set. And so that first one, um, let me let me first sort of scale it a little bit. I'll mul multiply it by 0.7 to kind of tone it down, and then uh, I'm going to I'm going to duplicate it and then sort of scale it down a little bit more. Um, and then actually I'll I'll put I'll put the the one that's been sort of scaled twice at the bottom. And that gives me something that's a little bit closer to uh, to sort of dirt, I guess, at the edge of the uh, of the frozen lake. And then this looks pretty good, but I, I want to, you know, it looks a little bit like we're kind of looking straight down, and I, I'd like it to look like it recedes into the horizon. So right before these layers get uh, get uh, duplicated, what I can do is I'll take one minus y. And uh, and then multiply that in, and that'll kind of make the the top. So the blue is fading, but not the or sorry, the all the channels, but the blue are fading there. So you don't. Uh, let me stick the same the same effect uh, down here, um, and so that gives it a little bit of a fade out. I think that's a little too dark. So 
what I what I did in my little reference pre-baked one is I just stuck a square root in there to make the fade happen a little bit more gradually. So I've got a square root uh, down the front. So there's my my frozen lake. Cool. How are we doing on time, Kevin? I've got two more fits. Silence is consent. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for your patience. Uh, I would like to suggest that you take about, uh, I don't know, uh, run until 11.30 and then hand over to Don. Uh, can we run uh, a half an hour later on the record? Sure. Um, All right. Okay, so I'll, I'll quickly finish off these these two that I've got. So, um, sim, sort of riffing on the the theme of the, the prior one, uh, I'm I'm going to try to make some icicles. And um, this one, um, the the thing is, if I just take a sine curve, well, that's that's not going to be that great. But I'm going to do the same the same sort of thing. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it vertically, and uh, what I'll do is I'll I'll take you know several of these again and add them up. But the trouble is with an icicle, um, I, I kind of want uh, I kind of want things to be a little bit more abrupt because uh, you know icicles are are sharp, and so this. This kind of a you know mixing of sine curves gives you something, but it's not quite what I would consider ideally sharp. So what I've done in, in my reference one is I've added, uh, I've raised things to the tenth power, and that gives me a little bit more sharpness. So it's starting to look icicle-like, and then um, I I would like to uh, get the colors. Uh, you know, this this is red, and that's not quite uh, ideal. So, what I can do is divide. I'm gonna. Oh, I also want to sh sorry shift things down, um, but but not quite that far down. But I'm gonna do some additional multiplies here. So, what I'll do is for different color di cut different color channels, shift it by a different amount. So, like the first one, I'll put it up there, and then maybe for the next one, I'll I'll. Uh, Pull, so I've, the, the way to think of this is I've got this here. Let me show this pattern without that. So I've got this this pattern that I can use to to uh, to clip off to decide wh where the icicles extend to, and I've pulled out one channel that you see there in red, and then I've done a swap to pull up this 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 layer that I'm doing a comparison, and then I'll maybe shift it by a different amount so I get a different uh, overlap of the two. And then I'll do a dupe on there, and that will will give me my icicles. If I'm spelling icicles correctly. Um, and uh, just as a fun note, you can you know it's very easy to take these and and do fun things with them. So for example. If I take the, the x value and redefine it as the x value plus the t value, I can make this sort of animate along and, and do interesting things. So, you know, I can publish a redux of it. All right, um, looking at the time, I've got a little bit more. So we'll do one last one. Um, so this one, um, the, the goal I have in mind for it is, is to add some snow. And um, to to get the snow to uh, to behave, what I want to do is create um, kind of an interference field. And so I'm going to use something similar to the same technique that I did before, where I, I take some sine waves, a scale based on x, but now I'm going to mix in some that are um, that are scaled based on y. I'm going to instead of adding them, I'm going to multiply them together. And what this will do is, if I, actually, let me show one of these. So you kind of gradually get these, these kind of inter, interference patterns. And then if I add in, you know, more, more factors, um, 
they'll they'll get gradually more complicated. So they get sort of speckled, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna crib some some values that I I pre cooked here. So so if you take a whole bunch of these, you get quite a bunch of speckles, and that, that doesn't really look like snow. But um, and actually I'm gonna uh, actually I, I added one more to give it a little bit of twist to it. So this this kind of tilts it a little. So it's a, this is taking X and Y and then kind of mixing components of them. So it's not sort of purely aligned to the grid. But if I take this and I, and I compare this to 0.5, I'll, I'll get a couple of little, little drips here. And so that's, that's nice, but that's, um, I'd like to be able to have things move. And so the simplest way to accomplish that is, to, is not to, to uh, change the, you know, this field, but to move the coordinate system. And so I will redefine X as, uh, well, actually, let's, let's start with Y. So we'll take Y and uh, we'll, we'll take 0.5 times uh, the, the, the time and add it into Y. And that'll make the snow kind of go straight down. But, but just for fun, we can also maybe make Y have a tiny little bit of, or sorry, the X value have a little bit of adjustment so that the snow is sort of blowing directionally. And then uh, it, it, it'd be nice to add in a hill, but I've, the problem is now I'm moving my coordinate system around. So what I'm going to need to do is uh, preserve the uh, preserve the old original values of x and y. I'll just call them x, x, and y, y, so that I can uh, build a uh, like another sine curve, and then I could uh, compare that to y, y. And if I if I do that, well, that's 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 not quite. I don't want to hill that big. I, I want it to be kind of a a more spread out thing. And that's that's still that's more spread out, but I want it to be you know shorter. So I can I'll multiply it by 0.1 and kind of bring it down here. So that'll give me my hill. And then uh, I want to I want that to be you know the whole thing's going to be white. So I'll I'll or that together with the the snow. And then I would like to have it be white, so I'm going to duplicate that red channel, and then I get my scene with snow and a hill. So. so they're they're kind of fun and therapeutic, and hopefully a little seasonal. And actually, I believe haikus, proper haikus, uh, uh, poetry haikus, are supposed to make reference to a season. So, any questions? All right, I'll uh, hand, it, hand it off to, to uh, Don.